Now let's consider result variables. Functions have inputs and they have outputs. Consider a function f that has two input variables, i and j. f's output variable is k. It sets the value of k to i times j. f's input domain is the set of all possible pairs of values i and j. f's output domain is the set of all possible values of k. Programs create result variables all the time. For example, if you work for someone, they pay you. So let the variable i be the number of hours you worked, and let the variable j be your hourly rate of pay. So your pay should be the number of hours times the pay per hour, i times j. It's nice to know that the program can accept your number of hours correctly and store your pay rate correctly. But what you really want the payroll processing program to do is to give you a correct paycheck. So how should you test the program to make sure that it achieves the right result? Here's the first draft of my domain analysis on k. We know that k is an unsigned integer. That means it runs from 0 to max int. We also know that k can't be less than 0, because k is produced by i times j, and i and j are both positive numbers. They can't multiply to something less than 0. But it might be possible to push values at k that are bigger than max int. i and j both run from 0 to max int. So i times j can be as large as max int times max int. This table tells us what values of k are interesting to test. But the challenge with result variables is that you can't just enter a value into k and test it. The only way you can get values into k is indirectly, by entering values into i and j and letting them multiply to give you the k. Let's look at how this works. The first test in this table is k equals 0. So let's work through this indirect analysis to set up a test for k equals 0. The program calculates k from i times j. So if k is 0, that means that i times j must be 0. That defines an equivalence class. k is 0 over the set of all pairs i, j, such that i times j equals 0. Now the slide shows this class in set notation. For those of you who left university behind years ago, I know that set notation might not be something you work with every day. But equivalence classes are sets. And this is the most straightforward and the easiest way to accurately describe a set. Every concept that I show in symbols, I'm trying to explain in words. If you get confused, please post a query in the course's help forum. We're trying to decide what pairs of values of i and j to use to create a test for k equals 0. In terms of notation, rather than saying a pair of values of i and j, I find it easier to refer to an i, j pair. And I show that by writing i and j with parentheses around them. This is the notation for a two-tuple, a variable that has two dimensions. In our set of i, j pairs, if i times j is 0, then either i is 0 or else j is 0. The set of all these pairs is pretty large. If i is 0, then j can have any value from 0 to max int. If j is 0, then i can have any value from 0 to max int. The set has 2 times max int plus 1 elements. Which one should you pick? I'm not sure which pair to pick, so I'd sample a few. Maybe I'd test with 0, 0, and 0 max int and max int 0 but I probably wouldn't run all these tests at the same time. Maybe this week I'd try the pair 0, 0. Maybe next week, if I'm doing regression tests and this variable comes up, I'd try a different value, like 0 max int. With so many values in the ij set, and no obvious reason to prefer one over the other, there's no obvious best representative, or at least none to me, I'd try a different one every time. The equivalent set for k equals max int is certainly a lot smaller. It has 1 max int and max int 1 and some other values. What other values? Well, that depends on the value of max int. Max int is probably 2 to the 16th minus 1, or 2 to the 32 minus 1, or 2 to the 64 minus 1. I'm going to choose 2 to the 16th minus 1 arbitrarily, just to continue the example. If that's max int, there are 14 other pairs that yield i times j equals max int. So which one should you test? My first instinct is to test with 1 max int and max int 1. But you know, at some point I'm going to start feeling like I'm designing too many tests with zeros and ones and max ints in them. And when I do, I'll probably start using some of the other numbers instead. The last two values of the chart are easy. Let's start with max int plus 1. If max int is 2 to the 16 minus 1, then max int plus 1 is 2 to the 16th. A lot of values are going to take you to 2 to the 16th. On the chart, I'm using the square root, 2 to the 8 times 2 to the 8. As for max int times max int, there's only one test. 
i and j have to both be magzint. So now you have tests for all the values of k that we decided we wanted to test in our first draft domain analysis. So let me generalize how I describe result variables. i comma j shows a pair of values. You can also call a pair like this a two-tuple. x1 comma x2 comma dot 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 comma xn shows a combination of n values. This is called an n-tuple. Rather than writing x1 comma x2 comma dot 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 comma xn all the time, mathematicians will call this x, often a capital X, and everybody will know that this might be an n-dimensional variable. So when you see a function, y equals f of x, understand that x and y might have one dimension or more than one dimension, and x might or might not have the same number of dimensions as y. But in any case, x is the input variable, y is the output variable, which we also call the result variable. The set of possible values of x is the input domain. The set of possible values of y is the output domain. And whenever you focus your attention on y, you're testing a result variable. So just like you saw with k equals i times j, there are four steps to testing a result variable. First, figure out what values of the result variable you want to test. That's what I did in the first draft domain analysis for k which ended up calling for tests for k equals 0, max int, max plus 1, and max times max. Then figure out what values you need to assign to the input variable to get the values you want for the output variable. There are typically many different values for the input variable that can yield the same value for the output. So in our example, 1 times max int and 5 times max int divided by 5 were just two of the pairs that yielded k equals max int. So that leads to your final task, which is to select your test. Your test is a value of your input variable. It's selected from an equivalence class of values of the input variable that all yield the same value of the output variable. Remember, all you've done so far is to select your inputs. You still have a lot of test design left to do. What are you going to do with those inputs? What types of failures should you look for? And how can you improve the design of your test to make those failures easier to see? When you start talking about n-tuples, you're talking about multivariable testing. Most programs work with more than one variable at a time. I like to start testing with simple tests, focusing on each variable by itself. But once the program gets a little more stable, it's time to look at variables together, especially variables that are naturally grouped together. For example, a page setup dialog, it's not just about page width. It has five independent variables. All of these determine together how the program displays or prints the slides. So at some point, you should test the variables together. By the way, when I say five independent variables, the word independent has different possible meanings. All that I mean is that no value of one variable limits the values the other variables can take. Testing independent variables is much easier than testing variables that are not independent. Let me illustrate the challenges of testing variables together when the variables are not independent by looking at dates. February and December are valid months and 1 and 31 are valid numbers of days. So December 31 is a valid date, uh, but February 31, not so much. The month constrains the number of days. From the domain testing perspective, of course you don't want to test all the dates. There are too many of them. So our challenge becomes, which pairs of months and days can we use as best representatives? And for that, we have to look at a more complex space, a set of pairs of month and day instead of just individual values of months and days to work on independently. We'll work more on this in the next lecture. At last, it's time to summarize domain testing. These four slides present the schema that Doug, Somi, and I are publishing in the Domain Testing Workbook. You've seen the steps on this slide already. You've seen the steps on this slide already, too. In a more complete domain analysis, you'll also work with related variables. So far, the only related variable analysis we've done is to analyze result variables. And in the course of learning about a variable or a set of variables, you learn other things about the program that can help you do testing more effectively. It makes sense to capture these ideas. Many testers work with a concept map open all the time, adding new information and new test ideas as they discover them. We recommend that. Anytime you need to reduce the number of tests, you can look to domain analysis for help. Domain analysis can help you identify redundant tests, and it can help you strengthen the surviving tests by choosing more powerful values for their variables.